Thanks. Um, it's, it's great to be here. It's great to be in an actual lecture theater. And I hope that some of this magic that lecture theaters have also translates to the, to the online audience. Um, as we know, machine learning has made great advances in the last couple of years, and they have provided these very powerful tools for extracting statistical structure from data. And they give us tools for exploiting this structure, but numerically optimizing them for some performance measure. For example, we can optimize uh, a neural network to detect images or to classify images. But in science, we're often not interested in the data itself. We're more interested in what the data can tell us about the process that generated them. In particular, neuroscience, we're interested about the neural mechanisms that underlie some phenomenon we might be interested in. And at least conventional machine learning is not directly optimized for that, right? The goal of machine learning is not always to provide insights, and it's hard to write down a performance measure that will maximize the insight we get from uh, fitting a model to data. In contrast, the way that neuroscientists and other scientists typically approach this problem is by building mechanistic models. So we write down a model that encapsulates our assumptions about what we think generated the data, and then we compare this model to data, and we refine it and reject it. And this iterative process that gives us insights. And what we try to do in our work is to combine the advantages of these different approaches, the data-driven nature of machine learning, and the insight-driven data of mechanistic modeling in order to build better tools for data-driven scientific discovery. And in particular, we'll talk about some work today in which we use machine learning to solve one particular aspect of the process of applying mechanistic models to data, and that's the process of fitting them to data or finding out which mechanistic models might be compatible with a given data set. So one analysis question that we're often faced with in neuroscience, and we might have a piece of data, for example, voltage recording, and we might have a hypothesis about a suitable model, for example, a Hodgkin-Huxley model, and we want to find out which exact Hodgkin-Huxley model could have generated that data. Or we might have some population recordings, a set of spike trains, and we want to write down a model of two pools of neurons, and we want to adapt them such that they could have produced this particular data. The same is true in psychophysics. We might have recorded some behavioral measure, performance as a function of some stimulus variable, and we might want to have a drift diffusion model or some other process model and, and fit it to that data. So what these scenarios have in common, of course, is that we start off with a piece of data, and we have some mechanistic model, at least in a loose sense, and we want to bridge the gap between the two of them. And in fact, um, each of those models has parameters. So even if we've committed to a particular model class, we still have to find out what parameters within that model class would be realistic. And moreover, while we might have a lot of data, we're often not interested in fitting every aspect of the data individually, but we might have some summary features or properties of the data that we care about particularly. For example, in the case of population recordings, we might be interested in getting a model that reproduces the firing rates, but not every exact spike. <clears throat> so what would be useful, um, and we often, as computational neuroscientists, spend a lot of time tuning models and kind of reasoning about which model would be the right one. So what we're trying to do is build tools that make this process easier, in particular that help us find data-compatible models automatically. And we want to do this in the framework of Bayesian inference, because we mostly deal with stochastic models, and we want to have models that allow us, or an approach that allows us to incorporate our assumptions about what parameters might be realistic. So what would be amazing is to have an algorithm where you plug in a model, uh, for example, a hodgkin axel model, you plug in your prior assumptions about parameters, and you plug in some data, and then automatically returns um, a posterior distribution. And the posterior distribution will tell us which parameters are compatible both with the prior and the data. And importantly, we would be interested in the full posterior distribution. By that, I mean that we're not interested in one parameter set that fits your data, but we want to find the whole space of data-compatible parameters. And some of you might say, well, that's just Bayesian inference, so why don't you do Bayesian inference? Well, the answer is that if you try to do Bayesian inference in practice, in particular for the kind of models we care about in neuroscience, it's often not feasible, or you have to wait for a very long time uh, for your MCMC chain to converge, for example. So what we're trying to do is build tools that make Bayesian inference scalable to the kind of problems we care about in neuroscience. And we do this in the framework of what's called simulation-based inference. And the basic idea of simulation-based inference is that you say Bayesian inference is hard, so rather than trying to do it ourselves, we'll teach neural networks to do Bayesian inference for us. So the basic idea is that we want to have tools that can automatically do Bayesian inference on models from which we can generate data. And I want to just give you an intuition for how one of those algorithms can work, 
Um, and it's a particular algorithm that we and others have been working on in the last couple of years. And the basic idea of this is the following. We start off by randomly generating parameters from our prior. So that results in a lot of random parameters. And from these random parameters, we can generate random data sets. Okay? And that will give us a big lookup table of random parameters and random data sets generated by them. Once we've done that, this gives us a supervised learning problem by which we can train a neural network, and we will be interested in particular kind of neural networks called conditional density estimators that take as input the simulated data and try to predict the parameters that could have, or sorry, they try to predict those parameters that generated those simulated data. And that's a supervised learning problem. Input is simulated data, output is parameters or distributions over parameters. We can train that for as long as we want because it's typically cheap to generate sim simulated data. But once we're done training, we plug in some real data. So the network learns how to find data compatible parameters in simulated data. Once it's done training, we plug in the real data. And if we do this correctly, then we can do this in a way such that the output of the neural network is guaranteed to be the posterior distribution over the parameters given the data. So this is written down here as the parameters theta given some empirical data x0. And this density estimator itself will have parameters phi that we need to optimize over. And this general algorithm, um, this general algorithm will be inefficient because we basically generate lots and lots of random data. Okay? But the important thing to notice is that we can close the loop. So once this algorithm has started working, it will learn what kind of parameters are plausible, and then it becomes more efficient to generate additional simulations, not from random parameters, but from plausible parameters. And we call this algorithm sequential neural posterior estimation because we're interested in estimating posteriors. We use neural networks to do it, and we sometimes do it in a sequential fashion by adaptively um, adjusting our simulations. And this is an algorithm that builds on work in the statistics community called approximate Bayesian computation, as well as work by George Papamakaris and colleagues. And my group and others have kind of refined and extended this algorithm in various ways in the last couple of years. And I do want to point out that one of the things that was important to us is to provide a toolbox that makes it possible for non-experts as much as possible to use this algorithm. And you can find this toolbox um, uh, on, on our website. And one of the authors of that toolbox, Jan Berls, is also in the audience today. What I want to do in the following is just give you some examples of how this algorithm can be, or variants of this algorithm can be used in practice. I will not go into great details, but I will try to share some ideas of how this can be used in different applications. Let's first start by illustrating this on a simple example, the one I used to motivate it. Let's say we have a Hodgson Huxley model and we have 10 parameters that we don't know. Uh, we have a voltage trace, a response to a current injection, and then we can run the Snape algorithm and it will give us this kind of answer. So we'll just give a distribution over the parameters that could have generated the data. In this case, this will be a 10 dimensional distribution. It's hard to visualize 10 dimensional distribution. So the standard approach for doing this is by using these corner plots that on the diagonal show us each individual parameter that's compatible with the data. And on the off diagonal, it shows us the two dimensional marginals, so the pairwise constraints on parameters. In this particular case, this is simulated data, so we can check that the true parameters are used to generate this data in green have high, priority, uh, high probability under the posterior, which shows that this approach is, is plausible. And if we sample from this posterior distribution, we reassuringly will find data that looks very much like the one we put in. In contrast, if we take a parameter set that has low probability under the posterior, it will generate different data. So this is just kind of the basic approach of how you fit the model to data and then can check whether the results you have will be plausible. This is, um, and this doesn't only work on simulated data, so these are results on uh, data from the Allen cell type database, but obviously in these cases it's harder to check whether um, the two parameters are there. All we can do is check whether the results are plausible. As a second application, uh, we turn to a famous model in neuroscience, uh, the model of the somatogastric ganglion, which generates this uh, famous pyloric rhythm. And one of the reasons why this model is famous is because it has this intriguing property that you can get very similar network activity from very different parameters. So this is a classical example from a paper by Astrid Prince, where they found two similar-looking pyloric rhythms generated by very two different network models. And that's a challenge for inference because it means that given a piece of data, the posterior distribution will be very broad and possibly multimodal. Uh, we took a piece of data that we got from Zara Haddad and Eve Marder, 
Um, I'm marking here some properties of the rhythm that we care about. And this is to illustrate what I mentioned at the very beginning, that we're often interested not in fitting the whole data, but some properties of the data. And for example, in the, in the study of these paloid rhythms, the criterion is typically that they want a certain phase relationship between these um, bursts, but the exact details of the bursts don't matter. And this is extracellular data, so it looks a little bit different than the um, simulations I showed earlier. If, uh, and this is... Um, and what I'm showing now was part of a study by Pedro Gonsalves, Jan Matis Lukman, and Michael Deisler that was published uh, in eLife a few years ago. So if we take this uh, piece of data as the input, we can get a posterior distribution. In this case, it's a 31-dimensional posterior distribution over the parameters of this model. And you will probably see that this is very uh, high-dimensional and hard to get insights from. So let's check whether the results are plausible. We can do this by generating samples from the model. And if you do that, we will find that the samples from the model very much look in statistics, like the model we, uh, like the parameters we put in. In contrast, if, um, so you might say, well, maybe it's just the individual parameters are important, but not the pairwise and higher order constraints between them. We can check this by just generating parameters from the marginal distribution, so by ignoring dependencies by, between parameters. And when we do that, we get really bad fits to the data. And that reminds us that it's really the higher order structure fits that's important, and it's not enough that every individual parameter is in a realistic regime. One can study this model further, for example, by trying to check whether if you have two very different parameter sets that generate the same distribution, whether we can go from one to the other one without leaving this high probability land. In this case, you can numerically optimize for paths between the two different network configurations. The other thing one can do is by saying, well, how sensitive is the circuit to parameter perturbations? So we can numerically optimize for small perturbations that uh, make this rhythm break down. In this case, we can see that there might be these very elongated pieces of parameter space that are all produced the paloid rhythm, but sometimes it's very sensitive, so a small perturbation can take you off this um, high probability land. We can also use this to try to get insights into or get hypotheses for compensation mechanisms, so we can calculate the pairwise correlations between these parameters, and the correct thing to do here is to compute the conditional correlations, and we can see that some parameters are highly correlated, and that provides a hypothesis for which of those parameters would be compensating for each other um, if one of them is perturbed. And for most of these parameters, we don't have data. For some of them, we do have data, and, um, and, and Michael, who worked on this, went through a lot of literature, and this is an example of a study in Journal of Physiology um, by Yves Mahler's group, where he found evidence that this positive correlation that we found in the data maps onto perturbation experiments that people have done. Um, I will not talk about this further. I just want to briefly uh, highlight that this can also be used to, to study which circuit configurations are energy efficient. There's a new article by Pedro, and they also have a post about this today. And this is also my uh, short opportunity to advertise the other work we have posters about at the conference. Richard Gao will have a poster on using this approach to constrain um, network models of spike neurons. Jan Bölls will have a poster on how to use, uh, use simulation-based inference to constrain connectomic models. And Auguste Schulz has related work on uh, optimizing probabilistic encoding and decoding, decoding models using variational autoencoders. I will, in the last couple of minutes, um, talk about applications of this approach beyond neuroscience, because um, Really nothing I've talked about the machine learning so far has really been specific to applications in neuroscience. And one thing we found in our work is that these general tools for doing inference on, on nasty simulators is something that in its usability extends beyond neuroscience. I want to give two extreme examples of this. One is uh, at a case of an um, application to, to nanoscale imaging. So this is an image um, obtained super, uh, obtained using um, single molecule localization microscopy. Um, single molecule localization microscopy is a technique that heavily relies on inference algorithms because you basically take multiple um, um, measurements of a sparsified image and then you computationally have to extract the sources and combine them together. And there's various algorithms for doing this. We um, phrase this as a um, as a simulation-based inference problem. And when I say we, this is joint work with um, Srini Turaga's group at Genelia and Jonas Ries' group in, in Heidelberg, and Anna Kreschuk was also part of this collaboration. And the primary work was carried out by Arthur Speiser, a graduate student in the group. And we approached this problem of source reconstruction in super-resolution microscopy by phrasing it as a, as a Bayesian inference problem. And in this case, the forward model, 
that takes us from the sources to the measurements is just a simple physical model of the measurement process. And then inference is really saying, given some observed images, we want to do inference over the sources that could have generated them. So rather than trying to optimize the parameters, we now treat the sources as parameters and try to infer them. And in fact, we try to uh, infer distribution over parameters. And this is why, in this case, we had to do a lot of engineering to make this whole pipeline and the kind of models for distribution over images suitable to this particular application. But when it is done, um, it works well in the sense that the image that I showed you on the previous slide was a result of this algorithm. And if you compare this quantitatively to other algorithms, and there's a public benchmark challenge by Sage et al. that was uh, published in 2019, but that has been going on since, this algorithm achieves better performance than all other algorithms that we applied on these simulated data. So there's various performance measures, but by aggregating these performance measures, one can provide absolute rankings between different um, parameters. And the basic idea behind this approach is very similar to what um, I explained earlier, but obviously many of the details are adapted to this particular imaging application. My second example is at a very different spatial scale. Um, this is an artist's illustration of a black hole merger that happened 1.3 billion years ago. And the way we know about this black hole merger is because it emits these gravitational waves, and there's these extremely sensitive measurement devices, uh, laser in interferometers, that can pick them up. This is a particular famous black hole merger that was um, measured in 2015. And you can find, um, and they, they measure these two, these gravitational waves in different detectors, and they very much align. So that sort of provides evidence that this is not, um, not just noise. And importantly, physicists um, have ways by trying to infer from these measurements the properties of the black hole merger that they were interested in. For example, where on the sky was this black hole merger, what were the masses of the two involved black holes, what were the spins, etc., etc. And so there's a lit rich literature in physics on trying to solve these inference problems. They have a very good forward model for modeling gravitational waves, but inference is hard. So what we try to do is to figure out whether simulation-based inference can, these, uh, can solve these problems more quickly. And this is a collaboration with uh, the group of Bernhard Schulkopf in Tübingen and the department of Alessandra Buonanno in, at the Einstein Institute in Potsdam, and was carried out uh, by Max Dax, who's a graduate student in Bernhard's group, and Stephen Green, who's a postdoc in Alessandra's group. And we basically wrote down a simulation-based inference algorithm for this particular approach. And when one does this, does this, so this should be a simulation that shows that the that the orange lines, which is, are the results of uh, this simulation-based inference algorithm, very quickly converge to the blue lines, which is a ground truth result that you can get via MCMC sampling. And this is not only true for this particular parameter set, but we can do this more generally. So what's shown here is like a full or a snapshot of this full 15-dimensional posterior distribution, including the sky position that compares the simulation-based inference algorithm with a classical benchmark standard based on MCMC. So if you look at this plot closely, you would find that the blue lines, which is the classical solution, and the orange lines very much align. So could you argue that we've not really learned anything or the algorithm doesn't work better? But the important thing here is that MCMC sampling takes a lot of time. So in this case, it takes on the order of day or days for this MCMC algorithm to converge. The nice thing about simulation-based inference is that we have a very big upfront investment. We have to generate all these simulations. But once we've generated them, when we want to do inference at test time, all we have to do is plug data into a, into a neural network and do one forward pass. And one forward pass in a neural network is extremely fast. So in this case, that allows one to cut down inference time from order of hours and order of days to order of seconds. And that's important because it really enables real-time analyses or close to real-time analyses of the data rather than having to do them offline many, many days later. So um, what I wanted to show is that the kind of algorithms that we're starting to develop in the process of trying to fit neuroscience models to data also have applications in, in, in other scientific disciplines. So we are very excited about this kind of new perspective that uh, simulation-based inference gives us because it shows we can do Bayesian inference on mechanistic models, models that we really care about in cases where this was previously not possible, and we can do this much faster. So there's a so there is, um, there's new opportunities to tackle with these uh, problems that we couldn't tackle earlier. 
But at the same time, it's also important to realize that this is very much work in progress. So these algorithms are not perfect yet. They're still quite simulation hungry, so you will have to generate many simulations. They're not extremely robust, so when we don't have a good idea of how to set it up, that might not work out of the box. In many cases, we found that users of the toolbox were able to use it out of the box, but there are also cases where it still struggles. So as much as we're excited about this, uh, it's also clear to us that there's still a lot of work ahead of us, but, um, but we're very, um, very excited about doing this work. Um, I want to thank um, my group members and, and the funding sources, in particular the, the people highlighted in black, which is Jan, Michael, Richard, Pedro, Janne, Matthijs, and Auguste, all here. So it's very exciting for us to also um, go to this conference as a lab after a long period of, of not being able to travel. Uh, and finally, I want to advertise that we have both PhD student positions and postdoc and scientific programmer positions uh, to work on simulation-based inference, in particular in, for imaging. Thank you very much.